Welcome to the Art and Technology Podcast at DigitalSculpting.net, a fireside chat where innovation, creativity, technology, and science meet. Welcome back to the Art and Technology Podcast. We've been on a bit of sabbatical, but we're back with some fervor. I'm your host, Brigitte Monjon. The resurgence in podcasting is due to a new book titled 3D Technology and Fine Art and Craft. Today, we continue the adventure of interviewing many of the artists, craftsmen, vendors, and others who are featured in the book. Our tagline for these podcasts has always been a fireside chat. And in the up and coming podcast, you'll get to know some incredible guests featured in our book. Artists and designers share their inspiration, tips, and tricks. We certainly can't put all of the information in the book, but we do invite you to stay tuned and get to know these individuals in our future podcasts. And I'm so excited to have another artist from the 3D Technology and Fine Art and Craft book, um, Joshua Harker. And thank you so much, Joshua, for coming on. Uh, Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Joshua, I'm asking all the artists to tell me, and I'm so glad to have this podcast with you because it's one thing to see your artwork in the book. It's an entirely different thing to be able to hear your voice with your own inflection and talking about your process. So I'm glad that you're here to tell us about it. Yeah, again, I appreciate the opportunity to uh, to discuss what I'm up to. First of, first of all, tell me about how you, how and when you got into 3D technology. How and when? Um, well, I started working in uh, the product development uh, industry in the very early 90s. I, I was working as a commercial sculptor doing toys, like action figures and Happy Meal toys and stuff. And uh, bef- so that was my introduction uh, th- to the technology. So, you know, as I started working in these um, design development firms, uh, these machines, the 3D printing machines um, were showing up on the floors and started to be used for prototyping. And I had uh, previous, you know, to even entering this industry uh, as a fine artist, as a sculptor, uh, had been trying to make these things that I was doing two dimensionally. And I, there was no way to bridge into three dimensions with them because they're, you know, technical sophistication of, of the geometry. There's any medium I try, there's, you know, a very a, a reason that medium wouldn't work, whether it was wood or stone or metal or clay. Each one had its own reason <clears throat> that it really wouldn't hold up to the geometry I, I was trying to make. So when I first got my eyeballs on, on this technology, I knew right away I, I wanted to make art with it. Um, but also knew that there was just no way in the current state uh, that that was going to happen. So, you know, and that was because the resolution wasn't there or the material properties weren't ready. The software certainly wasn't ready for any kind of organic approach that that I was looking for. So over the next 20 years, um, I just continued to work with it uh, in that realm, you know, in these various uh, design development firms that I had worked at and prototype shops. And in 98, I opened my own studio and had bought two uh, very high-end object machines and we had a whole CNC machine shop and cast vacuum pressure casting uh, uh, shop with it and just did everything and so I, I really worked a lot more with it even more directly and, and just as things ticked along the, the, the software got better it made a big jump uh, to where I could do uh, organic things, this uh, mesh-based polygonal modeling software developed for animation. Uh, made a big jump forward, the, the uh, 3D printing technology jumped forward as far as resolutions and also uh, the way it was built, the way things were uh, supported during the builds, and the materials made a jump forward. So it was a, uh, it's kind of a long story, but it, it was a long trek, you know, from my introduction to it uh, all the way through to to when I could actually finally use it. So it was something that built over really about 20 years. Wow, that's quite a bit. And, you know, it's interesting as artists, because I've been around for it for a while as well, that, you you know, you'd sit back and you patiently wait for all of the stuff to catch up with what you want it to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It really was like that. So the piece that you're talking about that in the in the series would be the Tangle series, correct? Yeah, that that was the series that that uh, led me to and through 3D printing uh, and really you know kept me at it um, because those are yeah specifically the shapes uh, the geometries I'm talking about. Um, they uh, and I first got through it um, 
and, and, and built them in plastic. Uh, and then later needed to make this bridge. I felt I needed to make this bridge with archival materials of uh, specifically bronze, which had been used in fine arts and also, you know, what we'd use to make weapons and machinery for millennia. And, you know, again, that was another, uh, you know, kind of, uh, you know, sub step after, you know, even just getting to make these things physically was to figure out how to get them in metal. Um, and, and again, that was just a kind of a, a waiting and, and applying, you know, new technologies and new, um, new materials uh, as they came out and, you know, trying to work them into, you know, the processes and techniques that had existed for so long, those specifically lost wax casting. Uh, and that happened in early 2000s as well. So now the Tangle series, that's that's 3D printed directly in metal, correct? With selective <laughs> it, it, laser centering? It, it is not. And that was the problem because that technology existed and it seemed like an easy jump. But what, what's required in, in that process, at least till current day still, is uh, is you need a rigid support geometry structure to, to support this, this model as it's grown. Uh, even though there's still a nest of powdered metal with it, it's not enough with that particular, you know, application. So, you know, with these tangles, they're far too complex to get in there and actually remove all that support geometry and, and clean it out of there. So it had to be... A process that was um, offered a support nest uh, that could be removed, uh, similar to like SLS, which I, I use um, just really, uh, really commonly, and is one of the first ones I use for plastic. And that uses a, a powder nest, so you know, it's as support. So as the the parts built, it's built in this powder and only fuses some of the powder together. And when it's done, you just blow away the powder, and the whole piece is liberated. There is no mechanical removal of support geometries. Um, so the laser centering was, wasn't an option for the metal. So what came along is a, a company, Voxeljet, who was printing in powder base is an acrylic uh, medium. Uh, they call it PMMA, but it's acrylic uh, plastic based powder <clears throat> and using a binder, uh, jetted binder, more similar to like inkjet or, or like polyjet type of application rather than sintering. So they would bind this powder together uh, in, but still using the powder as the nest support. And when it was done, all the powder could be blown away. And I had this pattern that was in a material that would burn out with no ash content. So it was, you know, just perfectly suited for taking that pattern and, and, and taking it into the lost wax uh, casting process. And really the only thing we needed uh, beyond that was, it was a, a foundry that was able to do this under vacuum uh, because of the complexity and, and just you know, how the, the very long travels that had to happen very quick uh, in the geometries. This all had to be done under vacuum. But other than that, um, the pattern was printed in, in a material that would burn out was really the key, you know, that didn't have any supports or, or anything. So uh, I'm just now really starting to mess with the uh, the laser centered metals um and, but still haven't committed much to them just simply because of of that uh, necessity for supports on them uh as i understand though as they move forward that'll become less and less of an issue and and i'll be able to do more of my work even more directly well you know i'm all about trying to find things that will work with investment casting and 3d printing so i'm really glad that you did that but i'm surprised that you could get the shell out of such complicated pieces well, yeah, they, it was just, uh, it wasn't ceramic shell or anything. They went with, uh, you know, we did investment casting. So when it was done, uh, you know, it was pretty aggressive, really. I mean, it's hammer, you know, you're, you're taking a hammer to this mold and, and breaking it off of of the the cast piece, on, you know, inside. And on then anything inside, you know, really inside there, they're hitting with uh, sandblasters to, to blow all that out. So it's a very aggressive you know, process to get, you know, that, that piece out of, uh, out of the investment, um, you know, but it worked and it's, uh, and again, they're, they're, even with the laser centered metals, this la is still layered and fused. It's not this homogenous, you know, molten casting and doesn't have the same properties, you know, so, you know, symbolically, as far as what all this, these processes can do and how they can be utilized in other, you know, other applications and industries, you know, the fact that we can take a, a um, 
uh, that complex of a shape and actually cast it now is, is really profound when you understand uh, you know what the possibilities of that are and certainly the the direct printing uh, you know laser centered printing of metal is, is amazing as well but the properties aren't quite the same uh, and and the applications aren't quite as uh, as broad as uh, as being able to cast it and the laser centering, when I'm uh, in my research, because there are two, what you're talking about is two different types. There's one where the laser, and then there's actually one where something is is put down and infusing these powders together. Um, and are these both called center laser centering? I mean, you're not using a laser with one; you're using this this kind of like a mechanical glue to put pull these bind these things together. Are they still called laser centering, even with, with the binder? Well, no, you're right. Um, I'm not sure what they're, they're tagging that with. I mean, most of uh, uh, you know my experience with with that is done with this DMLS direct metal the direct metal laser centering, and it's um, and that's kind of split as I understand it into two things. Where one originally was being you know kind of loosely centered you know so that you could get this matrix and then that that the kind of the, this uh green state or, or it's how would you put it kind of the skeleton or whatever uh of the of the piece was then fused with metal it was infiltrated with, with molten metal to fill it up and actually you ended up with more of an alloy so now you know they're, they're doing stuff more you know directly with titaniums and steels as i understand and i think that's all being done as one uh, and, and that, as far as my understanding is, and, and what I've seen directly uh, done with EOS machines at EOS uh, of their, their fusing, is that it's done, you know, right there with the laser and the powder. Um, I don't know how much is being done with, uh, you know, with metals and, and binders and then in, in, in that infiltration anymore, actually. And, you know, I am not, uh, you know, certainly representing any manufacturer or anything. And I'm, you know, so I'm sure that application is still out there somewhere and, and being used. But, you know, what I'm aware of at this current time is, is really everything just being directly fused with a laser. Well, I'm real excited about the the different things that are happening with the metals. As a metal sculptor myself, I'm I'm thrilled with the idea. I just wish we could get a bigger build envelope and uh, a lower cost. <laughs> well, yeah, well, that's Voxel Jet right there. I mean, if you're talking, they've got the largest. Their their build envelopes are enormous. They're huge. You know, I, I want to say uh, three meters or something like that. They're you know, so they're you know, and that's just in a single build without putting pieces together. So they they really you know, gotten much, much bigger. And, um, and again, with that, once you're, that's, you know, a pattern, that's not a direct metal, uh, operation, but that's the one I use for my tangle. So you're printing these huge patterns that can then go to, you know, any foundry, you know, and there's, you know, obviously the network of fine art casting foundries is, uh, is quite extensive. So, you know, there, there really is a jump in, in, in that, uh, liberation of uh, scale that we're, we're able to apply this technology to much larger pieces now. Well, I'm thrilled with that. And I'm also th thrilled to see the digital technologies entering the foundry. And I think it probably entered the foundry first through the CNC milling and the, and the 3D scanning. But I'm just, I'm so glad to see that marriage happen because that's more in my ballpark. Um, tell me a little bit about your Kickstarter pro your Kickstarter that you did. Well, I had been doing the uh, the 3D printing stuff for a while. You know, it made these, uh, you know, what I considered achievements, at least personally, to you know, to get my work into three dimensions and 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 uh, build these things the way I, I had envisioned them. And I really, you know, was really excited about, it and I thought that would be shared. So when I went, you know, kind of into the arts industry with this stuff, uh, everybody. You know, there was an appreciation for what I had done artistically and kind of my approach. It's a neo-surrealism uh, uh, technique called automatism that I, you know, kind of turned into a three-dimensional um, approach. They, 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 they appreciated that, but they didn't understand the, the technology. And they were like, so a computer did this for you or the, you know, the machine is making this for you. You know, all these things about where the art you know started or stopped and what the computer was doing and and not only in uh resistance but um the also but also in um 
uh, how to sell it, I suppose. You know, if, if they didn't even know what it really was, they weren't going to be able to know how to, you know, sell it, I guess, to their collectors. And then on the other side, the, you know, the technology, you know, from the, uh, you know, like the machining industry and the, and the 3D printing industry, you know, they really were appreciating what I had done with the technology, but didn't understand the art or really care about it unless <laughs> they could sell a machine with it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I felt stymied, you know, and it was really frustrated with, I didn't know where to go with it, you know, and, and, um, and you know, and I, I learned context was a big thing, you know, and, and you know, and I, I also learned I needed to kind of suck it up and that education was going to be a part of this, getting people to understand what I was doing. So anyway, I just, uh, I kind of shed uh, all of this, uh, you know, this commitment, uh, you know, to the the traditional ways of doing all these things, of getting out, art out there and sharing it and all that stuff, and was uh, having a lot of success with social media as far as feedback and attention. And, you know, so I knew people liked it, you know, but I needed to, you know, turn that into, you know, some kind of functional way of actually, you know, selling art and, and, and really getting more people to see it. So Kickstarter just uh, really come out. Uh, you know, it was really just starting to, to, to show itself and it blipped on my radar. So I thought I would do an experiment and see see what happened, you know. So it was a $500 goal and it really, I mean, I was very serious about it. I, I was very thorough and I, I put a lot behind it. I wanted it to work. But, you know, essentially it was a um, it was an experiment. It, it, you know, was certainly not at any place, you know, that it is now as far as the the you know, how populated it is and the types of numbers, you know, that these, um, you know, tech design and technology uh, projects are getting. You know, uh, I think at the time, the largest funded uh, project of all time was still under a million dollars. So this was early days. But anyway, I put it up looking for $500. And um, I think it went live at midnight that night. And when I woke up in the morning, you know, eight hours later, it was already fully funded. It was overfunded. So Right there, I was just amazed how quickly stuff had happened and that I'd even done that. And so, I, you know, that was day one, and I, I was excited. About day three, the whole thing went viral. All these, you know, the blog circuits and and all these design and, and um, art sites and everything, the 3D printing kind of, you know, tech news, it, it just started getting picked up everywhere. And my phone was just constantly pinging with... Uh, with all these notifications, these emails, I was just getting, you know, uh, uh, pledge after pledge. And, and it was, uh, so it just, that was really where it took off. And it ended up making 77,000 some dollars. And it, it still is to this day, the most funded sculpture project that they've ever had. And wow. yeah, it'd be, and it's also, um, as I understand the highest percentage over goal project that they've of any project they've ever had. So um, it, it was, a, you know, I guess a smashing success. It really proved itself as a viable way to, uh, you know, to share our art, to, uh, you know, to sell art, to, you know, all of that. So very cool experience and, and um, you know, really opened my eyes to really, you know, committing us in new medium, but also new ways of marketing and selling and, and looking at this and just using all these new tools and being as creative as I possibly could, even outside of my art, you know, but how I, how I share it, so... Absolutely. And so, but, but when you did this Kickstarter, of course, you're having to offer people something. So you had to create all these things and ship them off. Correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, so, you know, on one hand, you know, the 3D printing, uh, you know, everything and how I did it and, and, you know, really supported, uh, you know, using it for Kickstarter. That's the thing. It made a lot of sense. I, I didn't have to, you know, make all these things in my garage or something or, or you know, paint all, you know, a thousand pictures or something. You know, I, I had this design and I could have it 3D printing. So there was, I kind of had this manufacturing uh, uh, aspect, you know, built into the this technology that I used to make my art that could, you know, support, you know, whatever uh, amount of rewards were, were that I need to send out. The thing I, I really didn't bargain for, uh, and it was fine, but you know everybody keeps looking at this dollar amount that I made, and it was you know so much money went into ma just you know making the pieces, but also uh, shipping and handling and and just getting those things delivered, and you know the you wouldn't and I was not set up, so I mean this was really I mean literally I was putting stamps on boxes, you know I wasn't printing out bar barcodes you know through a uh, I wish I was. I mean, now I know I've, I've gotten much better at it, you know, as far as, you know, how I run, you, you know, my 
my delivery of you know my pieces you know but yeah a thousand pieces had to go out in like no time so it was very very intense and uh and that was a big part of it a big expense i didn't quite uh, expect beginning was fine but um that was uh and that's the thing everybody thinks I'll run this project, and if it's successful, great. And I sell these pieces, I get this money, and in yippee, or you know, I get to you know move on or build or do whatever I'm going to do with the project. You know, there's all the, of this stuff, the management of the project, uh, the shipping of the pieces. You know, certainly making the, you know whatever it is you're you're making. Um, you know, and then the follow up with it is just. It's really crazy, but all in a, in the most wonderful way for me. But I, I do think people have gotten in way, way, way over their heads and had you know poor experiences because they just didn't know what you know. Their too much success was you know was their failure basically sometimes. So it worked for me, but it, it was a lot more than I expected for sure. As someone who has a shipping department, I totally get it. <laughs> yeah, you just don't know how much that goes into that, you know? Right. So um, tell me about the software that you used for both of those projects, the Tangle <laughs> and the Skull, because the Skull was the Kickstarter, correct? The Skull was the Kickstarter, yeah. It was a, it was a symbol for, you know, kind of the death of, of this commitment, you know, this end of this my commitment to to uh, how I was doing things, and then the, the filigree, uh, you know, uh, pattern was kind of this symbol of this creative exploration of, of trying new things and new medium and so on. So um, I use uh, I use a variety of programs and you know always jumping back and forth through them. You know, a Blender, SolidWorks, ZBrush, a little bit of 3D Studio Max, and it depends on the project. Uh, you know, which one I use the most, or you know, sometimes one or two of them I don't use at all. It just depends. So it's typically a mixture. And in the in the very early days with the um, with the Tangles, uh, there was actually about twelve programs that I had to use, and and much of it for just kind of the tech and and prep stuff at the end. Um, and it was it was just it was just the worst. You know, every everything needed another program to convert. You know, from one file format to another to decimate the file so it you know was small enough that I could actually you know feed it into a uh, you know that a printer CPU could you know read it that it wasn't too voluminous and uh, gee, repair and validation all of that stuff scaling it was just so terribly uh, uh, tedious and laborious and then they as 3D printing moved along you, you know now more and more of these things are all. Uh, available as either plugins or now you know just natively integrated into into these programs, so I can do more and more, you know, directly in the in the uh, in the programs I'm working in. So now I'm you know I'm typically working within maybe three programs in any any given uh, project. And uh, if you're really to boil it down, I'd say it's probably Blender and ZBrush and um, SolidWorks right now. And you don't don't scare off the readers that may have read the the book or want to read a book and get into involved in 3D technology and fine art and craft because it has changed considerably. Yeah. And we talk about that in the book. I mean, I remember just a few years ago retopologizing was the holy grail of things. And now you simply just press a button and it retopologizes. And Yeah, it was it was so te- it was just so tedious, you know. And frustrating because if you're trying to get to a final product and and for me you know uh, my husband keeps telling me you know you need to learn more of this part of the 3d technology or this part i don't want to learn a lot of that stuff i just want to create in the way that i want to create and i want to get it from point a to point b and i don't think that i'm alone in that i think that a lot of people that are entering the technology they don't want to be computer graphic people and tech nerds. They just want yeah. to create. Well, I've been in it a long time, and, and I'm good at it now, and I don't want to do it. You know, I, <laughs> I don't. You know, I use it, but that's the thing. These tools, and they are, just like you're saying, they've gotten much better, and there's much more, like, entry-level stuff, so you can, you know, that there's it's so much easier and so much more intuitive than anything I ever had when I first first started doing this stuff. So it's, it's really come a long ways, you know. And the vendors and the service bureaus are becoming much more helpful and educating, and a lot of the processes, the final steps 
are are done at their at their level. And then a new thing, which I think is coming up, is there's actually companies that are coming up that are playing the middleman between the artist and the technology so that they can take care of all of the details of the files and you don't have to worry about it. And I think that that's going to be a really nice thing to have for a lot of people. Yeah, I would that that would be a good niche. I mean, I, I you know, I could see using that. It, it takes a lot of a lot of my time uh, away from creating just, you know, doing all this prep work. Uh, which again has gotten better, but still something that uh, you know I don't want to deal with if I don't have to. And one of the you know basic reasons that I got into technology was because that I really wanted more time to create, and my CNC milling and enlarging for my monumental bronzes gives me much more time to create. So um, use the tools to your advantage. Now I have to ask you about articulation because this last piece, I don't even know if it's the last piece, but the piece with the wings and the skull, it just moves. It's so wonderful. And, um, but I can't imagine, and I have no concept, my brain doesn't work in that way, how you create something in the computer to know that it's going to move. And I'm wondering how many prints that you had to do to make sure that this thing really articulated the way you needed it to. Yeah, um, that is, that's the sec- I actually did a Kickstarter project with that one, the second one I did. And uh, it was at the time, like third most funded or something. So it, it, you know, people are really liking this, you know, 3D printed stuff on Kickstarter. Um, but it, uh, the articulation part of it, um, I don't know, there's, the wings are, are really the only part that are mechanical or kinetic. And there's about 100 pieces in that. And they're all printed as a single assembly also. So all these are just, what's amazing again with the technology is that you can set all this up, print it, and, and it's ready to go. Um, you know, which was, which was great as far as, again, you know, fulfilling rewards. I didn't have this whole assembly process I had to do. Uh, you know, I, I get the, the pieces in and I just had to package them, you know, clean them, check them over and, and package them, send them out. But as far as, far as designing it, uh, and, and you know, knowing what to do, it, it, it's hard to you know just you know. I wish I could you know I had a magic bullet where I, where I could tell someone you know you just do this and it's just going to be fine. But I, it is as much as anything, it's experience. I you know having worked in the in that product development uh, industry for so long and had done so many toys and 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 that moved into other things i started doing a, but what bridged me into that was uh not just doing the sculpture of them but if they had to do something then they started wanting me to work on the mechanics of it you know and it was simple stuff you know especially in the beginning um you know just little gears or something gearing or a little clutch in there or something like that but then that got more and more sophisticated more and more involved and i just i just had a lot of experience doing it and kind of knew what to expect and had been using 3d printing to prototype these things so you know i had that to go on um but you know when you're still when you're designing it um you know all the things that have to do with the mechanical engineering and physics you know apply and as you scale that stuff up and uh, you know things change as well um I, again, intuition is, is a little bit of it. Uh, with the wings, the first set I got back worked. I did make some changes, uh, you know, based on, you know, some little things I wanted to kind of clean up or, but, but they did work. Um, so uh, there's the, my most recent piece, I have a piece I did called Monochromatic Radiance, which I just showed in New York at the 3D print show. And that's made of about 2000 pieces that I hand assembled. And it's, uh, you know, it's just gear after gear. There's 12 arms and, and 12 gear sets on each one of those and, and all these rocker arms, and they run off this planetary gear set in the center. Um, you can see it on my website, but it's, uh, it's you know, I don't know what, why I get into those things. They, they, about, they about kill me. Um, you, you create this monster, and then you get to this point of no return. you got to finish it. So, it, you know, I'm not, it's not easy is what I want to say, even when you're, when you've done a few of them. Um, it's, um, I, you know, I, I don't know how to, you know, really explain a way to, uh, to approach it other than, uh, you know, maybe philosophically. I mean, you know, the form follows function is definitely part of it. You know, I have a vision of what I want to do, but, you know, if you want it to do something, there's mechanical things that have to happen. And, and you end up, you know, working back and forth between, 
you know, the aesthetics of it and also the functionality of it. And, and inevitably, the functionality is going to influence what it looks like. Uh, and, and things kind of happen and, or have to happen and you have to follow along with it. it it's definitely a different process uh, than, you know, what I do with my, like my automatism stuff or, you know, kind of this linear pattern work that I do on representational objects like the skull. So, uh, um, you know, it, again, I wish I, could, I wish I could put it in a little box and say, you know, do this and this and you're good. But, uh, you know, definitely experience it goes a long, long way with that stuff. So. Yeah. And, and rightly so. What we'll try to do is put some support um, and, and tech things that we find on articulation on the book's accompanying website. Um, tell me who your vendors are so that we can all, you know, here, here's a good chance for you to plug your vendors. Are you using service bureaus? I use everything in, in every, well, not everyone. You know, I, I, I work with some local people here in Chicago. Um, Paradigm Development Group is uh, the uh, the company I used to uh, that I founded in '98. I ran it uh, through 2008 before selling my partnership uh, to to go back to fine art. But I, I work with those guys still. They're still running strong and and uh, have even more machines now uh, than they than they did when I was there. And they're great guys. On top of it, I work with the 3D printer experience in Chicago. Uh, they uh, they run the EOS SLS. Uh, um, systems that I, I'm so fond of that I use for you know almost everything I do these days. Uh, I work with, directly with Voxel Jet and directly with EOS as well. But uh, you know for the metal stuff, I've been doing a lot with Voxel Jet, and they're out of Germany, but they're moving into the states. Um, and you know the online service bureau Shapeways certainly. Uh, I worked with Sculptio. I've worked with uh, Pinoco or Ponoco. I can never remember how to pronounce that correctly. Um, and you know, who else have I, you know, really just, you know, on top of that, there's another dozen people I've done little projects with and it's growing and, and it seems like everybody specializing, you know, one place will do, you know, more metal stuff or be better at one thing or, or have certain machines. And certainly the bigger places, you know, like the Shapeways, you know, they're really working towards trying to be a one-stop shop and provide everything, you know, but they definitely work in volume, you know, so there's projects uh, where, you know, there's things that I need to assemble or or have considerations. Uh, you know, you know, with details or or different materials or or various things that they're really just not built. You know, to handle that kind of attention to detail. So, you know, those things I I I I really always work with the local local vendor on those kinds of things. Well, if you have a list of them, we'd be happy to put them up on the website. Sure. Also, also um, have you found, I know that there's a conversation that is had between fine artists and the technology, um, and maybe not so much now as it was 10 or 20 years ago, but um, or even five years ago, but are you finding that in the galleries and museums that the 3D technology is being more accepted as a medium in art? It, it is, it is, and, and I think... Uh, you know, all this hype and buzz about this tech, you know, this nearly 30 year old technology, which everyone thinks they just discovered, you know, five years ago, um, is, is helping. So, you know, the RepRap project and, you know, how the costs have come down and, and people are, you know, hobbyists and are getting their hands on these things and things are getting better. I think that's all really supported that there's so much out there and every, everybody's now heard about 3D printing, whether they know much about it or not is another thing. But, you know, it's now in the, um, you know, the, the kind of public vernacular and, and you know, the, the galleries and the museums now, it's not the first time they've seen it now. And, and now there are a few people that have been working in it a long time and have shown, you know, kind of the thought process and the discovery process, uh, you know, of how they've used it as a medium. Uh, so it is, it is getting easier uh, to talk with them and to sell through them and, you know, all of that. I, and I'm doing all of those things now, uh, you know, which was such a struggle and, and really just a brick wall before, you know, definitely is opening up. And, you know, it, it, part of the education, but also, you know, the collectors out there now are seeing it and are interested in these things, you know, that are exciting and, you know, things they've never seen before that, you know, couldn't be made other ways. So, you know, they're looking for it. And, you know, if they're looking for it, you know, the galleries are trying to provide uh, for their, um, you know, for their collectors and, there's been some very good exhibits put together over the last few years uh, at various museums, um, and uh, and you know I'm certainly only uh, uh, expecting more in the future. So, and how do you um, how do you bridge that with the um, 
commercial commercialization or the fact that it, a manufactured piece as compared to a fine art piece. So do you do like a limited edition? Um, how are you how are you handling that? Well, I'm doing both. And I and that's been a question you know, and everybody. It, it's it's funny, like. For instance, before I was really working with 3D printing, I was uh, uh, doing a lot of figure sculpture, like in clay. And I was finding that, you know, the original, the, you know, the, the material and the piece that I actually touched with my fingers, you know, that one of a kind was worth less, you know, in the industry, you know, quote unquote less than uh, like a, an addition of 10 bronze castings. Now, th those castings, limited or not, are, are just reproductions. I don't care what anyone says, you know, and I'm not diminishing, you know, the skill or the value of, a, a, of, of you know, the foundryman's work or, or any of that, but it is a reproduction. It is not the one of a kind or the original. So when you look at the 3D printed medium, uh, you know, philosophically speaking, I don't see any difference, um, and I just see it as a. And if anything, you know, the uh, you know as the addition goes, and the numbers through the addition are even less uh, important because there is no, you know, diminished uh, or deterioration of the mold as it goes, and and you know each successive. Uh, uh, casting is worse. So what it comes down to is kind of this scarcity, this artificial scarcity. Everyone th thinks they need, you know, to have value in the art, and and I don't, I don't see how other than valuation, money valuation of the art, I, I, I don't understand uh, how that's a good argument because the, just because something costs more, there is no good argument in my mind that that means that it is better art. Um, and there's all kinds of examples for that. But so I, I think the art is separate from, you know, what the piece is. And in a lot of ways, the 3D printers are, uh, in my mind, what I do, I mean, the art is really done before it's ever even made. And the, and the printed piece is a documentation of the work, you know, the best way to tangibly make it physically and to share it. Um, so, in, you know, if the valuation of that or the cost or whatever is something people you know want to get their panties in a bunch about that's fine but it's not really really not my problem you know um and i and i do a, a few things sometimes i just do a one of a kind i do it's 3d printed but i'm not making another one i don't want to bother with it and if that's worth more because there's only one of them fine but i do you know, a lot of open edition stuff where you know if one day I, I decide to quit making it fine but for now i mean i'm not putting numbers on them and, and they're available um you know, but they're also not uh, the type of thing, uh, you know, that I would ever, uh, you, you know, mass manufacture. It's not, it's still a, it's something that has to be made, uh, you know, through the process I'm doing it. But, uh, you know, I guess my approach or my look at it is that you're really buying the art and the design more than you're buying what it's made out of. Um, so, and, and that's just all inherent stuff in this new medium. You know, there's things that it's not going to fit that, you know, that we've grown accustomed to as far as, you know, other other mediums. And, and we can't, you know, just turn it into something or make it be something it's not. It's, it has its own character and its own uh, things it can do and its own th things that, you know, it, it doesn't do within all those definitions that we use in, 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 in the art world. Um, so we just need to get used to it and kind of, uh, you know, Everybody wants to label everything and, and fine, but um, you know, label it for what it is, I guess, rather than trying to you know fit it in where it doesn't belong. Yeah. What's on your uh, what's what's in the future for you? What are you doing? What are you working on? Um, well, I'm trying some new things. Uh, for a long while, uh, being a, a more classically disciplined uh, sculptor, you know, where form and, and uh, representation in early days was a big thing and even in my abstract stuff it's funny there's still kind of a uh, a, a character an entity about it but um you know I, i'm a, i'm doing some things that are a little more conceptual i'm also bringing in um the scanning technology into some of my work uh i'm, I'm going to start playing with that as well as uh, some algorithmic stuff which i've always uh, resisted in and, and the way i'm using it um it meets my sensibilities of, of what I want to do with it. I'm not, you know, just doing a, a math formula or a, ge you know, a, a geometric model or something like that that's, you know, made off of math, you know, off of math, which is fine. I'm just not, a, you know, like a math artist or whatever. Um, but I'm starting to play with some of these different things as far as, you know, computation and also, you know, again, scan forms and, and, and work, just kind of bring them into the fold and, and start to experiment and play with, um, you know, with them uh, within how I approach uh, my art and my vision. So, uh, 
and then I'm doing some things outside the medium completely, uh, where you know a lot of the design and the back and forth between the things I have to make are done in the digital realm, but 3D printing is actually not involved at all. So again, so using all these tools, but you know branching out all the time, I, I kind of have this path. But I intentionally like to to leave it. Um, I just did some, I just did some fashion stuff, a big headdress uh, for catwalk events in um, London and Paris and New York. And you know, I'm not going to become a fashion designer, but I, I do like to to leave the road and and see what's going on and try new things and uh, you know, and see what's out there and how it affects my art. You know, I, I feel affected. You know, on the outside as well. You know, there's things I want to do from my vision but the the tools i have and the different things happening i like to bring that in and and feel like it's you know also influential on my art so you know i, I seek that out intentionally i've just really enjoyed our conversation and um i'm i want to thank you for being a pioneer in this industry and for sharing your experience your vendors your software and all the rest that you've Ex experienced and you've shared. I'm thrilled that you're going to be a part of the 3D technology and fine art and craft book. And um, I can't wait to put the, your images in the book. Thanks. Uh, th again, thanks so much for having me on here to, uh, you know, just to discuss this stuff. And, and uh, I appreciate the conversation. Sure. Hope we can inspire others to um, explore and experiment and see what else comes out of it, because we can push those limits of this technology. Right. Yeah. I, I, I feel the same way. I, I, I'd love to um, I'd love to see people try it, you know, and, and we're at a point where that can be done now. You can get your hands on all this stuff. It's not... Uh, you know, it's not out of reach anymore, whether it's the software, the technology, the service bureaus, it's, you know, if you're on the internet, you can do any of this stuff. Right, exactly. And that's what we talk about in the book, that you don't really ha even have to have a computer, for crying out loud. So um, it's, it's really interesting, and I'm excited. Thanks so much, and I'm looking forward to uh, seeing some of your work in person. Right, well, thank you. You have been listening to the Art and Technology Podcast. You can find these podcasts at digitalsculpting.net or on iTunes. Please check back with us next time to hear some more of our guests from the 3D Technology and Fine Art and Craft book.